Hey, I'm Melissa. I'm Jam. And I'm a chemist. And I'm not. And welcome to Chemistry for Your Life. The podcast helps you understand the chemistry of your everyday life. A bonus edition. Bonus edition. And you know what's exciting about this one? What is it? This will be the first time we have a question from one of our Patreon supporters. Nice. And they can send in a voice memo. Yes. So our first question of today, you're going to hear from Tim. I'm Timothy of Frisco, Texas. And my question is, why does eating raw garlic cause your mouth to burn? Okay, so I didn't know this happened. I didn't either. I am very, I like garlic, but I'm very sensitive to it in the sense that yeah. like, not in like it makes my stomach turn like that. Just yeah. a little bit of garlic goes a long way for me. So That's how I feel too, yeah. Even the idea of placing raw garlic in one's mouth as he's talking about here almost makes me want to throw up. Yeah, well, guess what? It's kind of wild. Because and it sounds like it's worse than throwing up. It's your mouth burning. <laughs> or it's not worse, but it's different. Well, throwing up can also make your mouth burn if there's a high acid concentration. Right, right. So here's what's wild. There's two different types of burning, as we discussed before on the capsaicin episode. There is the sensation that things are burning because they're triggering pain sensors and heat receptors, even though it's not actually causing damage. Okay. And turns out garlic does that. It uses a similar, well, similar slash the same ion channels as wasabi and chili peppers. Okay. So part of that burning sensation is the same as capsaicin, where nothing actually is happening to you, but the pain receptors think that there is something happening to you. Right. So that happens. So that's part of it. Is okay. It just, whatever gets released from raw garlic triggers a similar path to your brain as a capsaicin episode, like the same kind of uh, pathway that makes you think it's burning, but it's not. Okay. Okay, but also it can cause another kind of burn, an actual burn where you're being burned, a chemical burn. But it only happens if you're a vampire. <laughs> no, it can That's... happen to anyone. Oh, interesting. <laughs> it's rare, but it's the, I mean, the exact phrase is like oral mucosa. So like your, your soft tissues or your, you know, like the tissue in your mouth is different uh -huh. than like your outside skin. Right. So that skin can be sensitive to raw garlic, which some people use as a homeopathic treatment. Ah. So there was one case study I read where a woman had been eating raw garlic to ward off COVID-19 uh -huh. as like a homeopathic treatment. And then she went to the doctor and had sores and chemical burns on her mouth from the garlic. Oh, I see. And there was another one where a man thought the garlic would relieve some oral like tooth pain that he had. So he put like crushed up raw garlic there and instead he got like a chemical burn there, Oof. which is like even worse probably than it was before. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. And that is just because there are chemicals that cause chemical burns that are in garlic. And normally it's small enough amounts that it doesn't really matter. But if you put that in concentrated amounts regularly directly on those mucous membranes, your oral mucosa, then that could be problematic. So those some of those chemicals are disulfide, allicin. I mean, I don't know if this means anything to anyone. Alpropyl disulfide. All of those things... Basically, just some naturally occurring chemicals in garlic can cause it. They call it coagulation necrosis. So Dang. basically, it just tries to kill off the tissue. <laughs> wow. So not fun, but that's why garlic burns your mouth in two different ways. Wow. That's very surprising. And I just know. to ask the question, we're all wondering, are we sure that in those two cases, those two individuals were not vampires? <laughs> I guess we're not. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, you know what? TBD. Whoa. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, maybe they were, maybe they didn't know they're vampires. Like, wouldn't you know? I don't know. Also, can vampires eat the garlic? I feel like it would start burning their skin the moment they touched it. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe they're like one of their great grandfathers or great grandmothers <laughs> was a vampire. So they've got like, like some recessive genes of the yeah. vampire stuff, but maybe they only discover it when they try to put a lot of garlic on a sore in their mouth or whatever i was gonna say when they turn 16 like have you have you heard that like when you turn 16 a witch gets her powers or whatever <laughs> but then yeah. 
But then one of those case studies, it was a 75 year old woman. So yeah, probably yeah. not there. Yeah. Probably not that. Anyway. Also eating raw garlic. I mean, I get it if you're like convinced it's going to help ward off. And there are, there are positive things to like that raw garlic has, uh-huh. but it, eating a clove of raw garlic, the idea of it, like I don't yeah. even like cutting it up cause it makes my fingers sticky. Yeah. And I don't like the way it makes it like makes my finger smell. I just hate it. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea of, of like popping it in and chewing it right. like gum. It has to <laughs> it would have to really like heal something super important <laughs> and be I'd have to be certain it was gonna help for me to want to put myself through that. Well it doesn't seem like it probably does that much to yeah. the extent that it could also hurt you. Though. Right. Or at so. least in these two cases it's not like yeah. Like maybe if you've got a mouth or a toothache or COVID, I'd rather have the toothache or COVID than chew some garlic. I don't know about <laughs> having COVID than chewing garlic because for some people that's really, really can be life threatening. That's true. I mean, I don't know. It's just, I'm so the garlic thing though for me. I don't know. <laughs> I just, I've had COVID. So I was like, I've had that. Have I ever chewed You'd rather had the case of COVID that you had. Yes. It was also early on in the pandemic. They didn't know. And she was elderly and immunocompromised. So for right. her, it was probably like. She's probably like, I'll try anything. Yeah. Yeah, I would too. So in that case, I probably would. Yeah. But there wasn't good evidence that garlic warded off COVID. If it was like, you chew this garlic or you have COVID-19, I'd be like, fine, I'll chew the garlic. Yeah, yeah. But the, but the off chance that it would maybe help. Right. And so I don't know. And I may answer this question differently. If I hadn't had COVID and had some expectation about how it would go if yeah. I had it again, you know what I mean? But yeah. Yeah. So if, if it was like whenever it was the, the unknown time when we all just were hearing stories, but none of us, most of us hadn't had it yet. Yeah. And a lot of stories. Were I think that's very, when it was. Yeah. Yeah. Understandable. Not, I'm not dogging on her at all. I'm just <laughs> thinking about if I were in her exact shoes, could I make myself chew the garlic? Ooh, and I just don't think I could. You would. If I think if your life was on the line, if that's what you thought. Okay. So the next one is some feedback from Kaiba, And I just want to shout him out because he's the biochemist in Brazil and he is like a resident biochemist consultant. I wish that this podcast made any money so that we could pay him and us. I mean, it makes yeah. It makes enough to keep itself going, but that's it. Yeah. But I'm like, if we had money, we would give Kay big gifts because he has shared so much knowledge on this podcast. Seriously. So. Yeah. It's been so cool hearing from him for like a couple of years now. I mean, yeah. I can't remember how long ago we first heard from him. But anyway, thank you for being so such a good listener and helping us, sending us yeah. really fun, interesting, cool stuff from the biochemistry his feedback more than anything else that we do really makes me wish I had paid better attention in biochemistry class. That was at a hard time in my life. I wasn't a very good student at that time. Uh-huh. I've learned a lot since then. I wish I could go back and like audit that class or something because I'm thinking I would probably have known this off the top of my head if I'd paid attention back then. Yeah. So to this message that Kaiba sent us, it's specifically about the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide poisoning. That's when I was wondering if people suffocate. I think it was in the catalytic converter episode, and I thought yeah. when people get carbon monoxide poisonings when they sit in their car in the garage when it's closed, I wonder, since there was so little carbon monoxide and more carbon dioxide, if they suffocate rather than get poisoned. Right, right. So here's what he wrote in and said. Hey, about the carbon monoxide intoxication, I just gave a lecture about it. How convenient. (laughs) I know, seriously. (laughs) So basically, we have red blood cells circulating in our blood, and these cells are full of a protein called hemoglobin that have an iron ion, 2 plus or 3 plus. The iron binds to the O2 and the CO2 with almost the same affinity. So when we breathe in air full of O2, we swap the CO2 binded to the hemoglobin in our lungs and the opposite happens in our tissues because they use the O2 to produce energy and CO2. But what happens to carbon monoxide is that hemoglobin affinity is almost 200 fold stronger for carbon monoxide than for oxygen for O2. Wow. And when we breathe carbon monoxide, it doesn't unbind. So we start to slowly asphyxiate. That's why when we are in a fire, we should always stay low to not breathe in any smoke because smoke is full of carbon monoxide due to partial combustion. 
you can probably explain better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the chemistry coming back. <laughs> there we go. It's why physicians should always check your throat for signs of ashes after fire because asphyxiation with carbon monoxide is silent. People just start to lose consciousness, get sleepy, and the treatment is basically to increase your O2 intake in a respirator. Isn't that amazing? That's crazy. Gosh, the fact that he just knew that, I had taught a lecture on it. Oh, I'm so excited. That makes so much sense because I thought there's so much more carbon dioxide than carbon monoxide in that garage. Why do we call it carbon monoxide poisoning? I don't understand. And there it is. It's a 200 times stronger binding effect. Right. So even if there's 200 times the O2 or whatever, then this carbon monoxide is going to be a stronger binder and yeah. it's just going to slowly build up and build up and it's not going to get exchanged out. That's crazy. And like, obviously maybe in the moment we could have paused that episode and looked it up, but so cool to hear straight from an expert. Right. Who clearly just gave a lecture about this. Yes. Knows exactly what he's talking about. And, and also hear it in a pretty boiled down understandable way. Right. And yeah, exactly. I could stop and look up every time we have a question, but if I lo looked up, if I stopped and looked up every single thing that came up while I was recording an episode, writing an episode, I mean, it would be unrealistic. Yeah. It would take so much longer of my time to look this up, understand what it was saying, boil it down, and then send it off. And Kaibe just sent this out into Instagram messages, and it seemed like pretty quick off the top of his head. Yep. And that's the value of having experts talk about their field. You know, I can talk more about chemistry, but this is a part of my, you know, this is not a part of my expertise, but it is for him. And so I like hearing it actually from that context more one, because it's more manageable. I don't have time to look up <laughs> every single thing that comes up, but two, what a great explanation. Yeah. So I really, and I wouldn't have gotten these bonus things about being low to the ground in a fire and physicians checking your throat for ashes. I probably wouldn't have learned all that. So yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love hearing experts talk about what they know about. It was just so exciting. When it said the 200 <laughs> fold stronger, I was like, oh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So, and that was a really good explanation. I loved it. So the next question is, <laughs> this one made me laugh. So that's why I wanted to read it instead of jam. It's from Ebony and she's in a video of Bella Hadid's wearing a spray on dress um, so I don't know what the event was for, but Bella Hadid went out wearing just basically like undergarments and got people around her to spray on a dress. <laughs> and I hadn't seen this yet, but Bella, or sorry, but Ebony sent it and said, I need to know the chemistry of this. Please help me. Yeah. <laughs> and that really made me laugh. She said she'd been thinking about it for days. So what I thought as a chemistry off the cuff, I just I said this to Ebony and then I went and I broke my own rule and I looked something up for this episode. But I was thinking it looked like a spray on polymer. Meaning that normally in Q and R's we don't look stuff up. Yes. But in like an episode, obviously we always there's always research. Oh yes, yes. sorry. <laughs> yeah. I wanna make sure that it wasn't like this rule that's always the case. We never look anything up. No, in Q and R's I don't look things up to make it a little bit easier and so that you get a more authentic, like, oh, this is what a chemist thinks about yeah. these things. Yep. Yep. So in this one, I thought it looked like a spray on polymer. So like if you think of when you paint on nail polish and then the solvent evaporates and it leaves behind sort of a film, it seemed like it was something similar where they were spraying polymer, like liquid polymer, and something allowed it to cross link and set on Bella Hadid's body. And so then I went and looked it up to see if that was real. And it is. There's a thing. It's it actually been around for like 20 years called Fabrican. It's a spray huh. on fabric. It's copyright. And so it really does just you spray and it instantly creates a sprayable nonwoven fabric. Wow. So it's like basically spray plastic or but it's more fabric material. Interesting. That's and crazy. A, a lot of our clothes are polymers. I mean, like. You always know that <laughs> you, for some reason, jam has a really good handle on fabric. Oh yeah, I do. That's weird. Yeah. Like polyester is. Yes. Polyester yeah. is a polymer. I don't right. know why I couldn't think of that. Yeah. So yes. So that was my thought. And just looking briefly at the Fabrican website, it seems like that probably is the technology that was used. I'm assuming that there's other types of like, maybe they didn't use exactly Fabrican, but right. 
something similar, some similar technology where it was a spray on yeah. fabric. Right. But my guess is that it was smaller units of something that could be polymerized. And in the spraying process, it either cross links those polymers that are already existing or sort of helps the polymer grow, maybe. It does sort of like an initiation step to get the the polymer growing like we talked about in the episode about super glue setting. Mm -hmm. So I would think it was either like that where it's exposure to the air and whatever else is going around causes the polymer to have this initiation step until it's all reacted or it's already in a polymerized form and it's doing more of a cross linking, which we talked about that in, um, in the episode about eggs where the strands of polymer find each other and sort of bind together to make a more sturdy structure. Right, right. So those are my guesses about what's going on at the molecular level, and I loved it. And I loved that Ebony sat around and thought about it for days <laughs> and was like, help me, I need to know. <laughs> it really, really made me laugh and because I will get into those modes sometimes. So yeah. thanks, Ebony. That is so funny. This next one is from Jessica. Jessica says... Hi, my name is Jessica, and I'm currently an undergrad in chemistry. I have been listening to Chemistry for Your Life for a few months now, and I thought I could ask a few questions that I'm curious about about chemistry in my own life. And that is exactly why I we, guess. mostly Melissa, are here. Yes. <laughs> no, you too. <laughs> I also ask questions. Um, how does bleach work on hair, and how does dark hair dye work on light or bleached hair? Hair dyeing is something I do for fun in my life. And it's never something I really thought deeply about all the chemicals and contents in the dye or bleach. Thank you for all the fun podcasts. Okay, here's what I know for sure. Because I follow some people who do hair dye on the internet. Okay. There is so much chemistry in hair dye. Some of it that I don't even know about, obviously, because that's not my area of expertise. I'm not like a hair dye chemist. Uh huh. But, for example, if you use certain types of henna dye there can be metal salts that then if you try to bleach it the metal salts will react to the bleach and it can burn or even cause Oof. a fire on your hair Yikes! i had no idea um so there's lots of chemistry involved and there's probably a lot i don't know we did do an episode on bleach though and right. we did an episode about hair right very early on it was yeah. it a series I think we did, and I think at least the hair one I'm thinking about was like the the shape of hair and mm -hmm. curly versus straight and that kind of stuff. And then bleach was, I guess, mostly about clothing, but I guess it would apply. It would definitely apply. So my thought is it's probably something similar to how bleach works just in real life, is that basically it's breaking pigment molecules that give your hair its color. Mm -hmm. And... When that is broken, then there's maybe room to deposit new color on. I think that there's a lot of color theory in there that makes it a lot more complicated, but that's just my thought. Chemistry off the cuff. I didn't do any researching on this question, but my thought is the bleach for hair works very similarly, which is why also they it looks sometimes damaged if you bleach it too much. Right. Because it can break those... the pigments in your hair which literally is causing damage to it but that gets rid of the color and then when you deposit new things on i assume it can kind of like grip on but i know grip onto the hair meaning the molecules can bind where there used to be pigments and all right it. right but i feel like there's so much i don't know about hair it's very complicated and i feel like there's not a lot of peer-reviewed journals around hair dye it almost seems like People said, well, <laughs> that's a cosmetic deal. We don't really care and sort of pushed it off to the side. Both times I looked into hair, it was very complicated mm. to get a good overview. And I think I think the episodes we did on that was one about the shape and then what happens when our hair gets damaged. So you might think those are interesting. And then you might see what you can find. Um, there are people in TikTok who are hair dye specialists who will share about some of the chemistry of that. So I've listened to that and thought, is there a way I can go verify this in academia too? Mm. But I haven't been able to yet. But I do think people who dye hair are very good at, like they, if they're good at their job, they have to be aware of chemicals right, <laughs> and right. how chemicals act and interact. And yeah, so very impressive. Yeah. 
So that's my hair dye spiel is basically I don't know, but I have a guess. <laughs> <laughs> and that's chemistry off the cuff for you, Jessica. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Maybe you could, I don't know if you know this, but you can be a cosmetic chemist. So if you like hair dye and you like makeup, there are jobs in industry that in makeup industry where people need chemists to formulate safe products for people. So look into that. Nice. We have a few more questions before we do that. Let me just. Jim's got to get a refill on that coffee. Refill in the coffee and <laughs> a good time to, to also plug our coffee hour, um, which doesn't have to be literal, but <laughs> if you're one of our, the top tier patrons for our Patreon, we are doing a monthly coffee hour. We get to hang and drink coffee, tea, whatever your drink of choice virtually and hang out and catch up and learn about each other and stuff. And it'll be super fun. Wow, that was really smooth. I did not know Jam was going to plug that just there. Yeah, I just kind of decided. It I just, just felt right. <laughs> you were like, you're doing your chemistry off the cuff. I was like, what can, What can I do off the cuff? <laughs> I could do coffee off the cuff, you know? Coffee off the cuff. Yeah, you definitely can. Should at our coffee hour, every time you give us a fun fact about coffee that people didn't already know, probably. I could definitely do that. I, I may run out, but I don't know. Maybe <laughs> not. We could try it for a while and see what happens. Okay, excellent. We could maybe open it up with that so that I don't forget, but. Um, so definitely check that out. Patreon.com slash camp for your life. Okay. Back to the questions. This okay. question is one that I don't think Melissa's going to be interested in at all. Sure. <laughs> From <laughs> Kate. Kate specifically asked about ceviche, which is like. Which I'm having for dinner tonight. Yeah. Melissa and Mason have this like every night, basically. No, what? <laughs> not every night. The number has I've heard Melissa say the phrase, we're having ceviche tonight, is many times. Okay. <laughs> so Kate asked, a question I have is about ceviche. How does the lemon juice, quote unquote, cook or cure the fish? Okay, Kate. Well, for this, I'm going to tell you, go all the way back to one of my favorite episodes we've ever done, where Jam came up with one of the best analogies I think he's ever come up with, the episode about eggs. Oh, right, right. Such a good one. And we talk about how, you know, a lot of meats and eggs are made up of protein and protein can be denatured, which basically means Protein is a polymer that's all folded in on itself and it gets unfolded and loses its specific shape. So the nature of the protein has changed. So denatured. And that is a lot of the cooking process. And then there's also sometimes cross-linking, ironically, which we already talked about, of polymers as well, which is why it sometimes turns from clear to solid or translucent to opaque. So the same thing happens when other things denature protein. So very acidic environments like lemon juice can denature proteins as well. Ah, And that is why the lemon juice is cooking the fish is it's denaturing proteins. Got it. I will say because we don't live on the coast and I am not 100% confident about the food that we eat, the shrimp that we eat in our ceviche, we do a quick boil. It's called a parboil. Uh-huh. We turn the water on, get it boiling, turn it off and put the shrimp in there just for like two to three minutes uh-huh. and then put it in the lemon or lime juice to further quote unquote cook, <laughs> like Got it. tenderize and everything. Uh-huh. But because we're worried about any other parasites or anything else in there, that par boiling sort of helps Got alleviate it. that fear. So we don't only use the lemon juice. We also do a parboiling method just for food safety in our very landlocked area. Right, right. <laughs> so I've gotten food poisoning from shrimp cocktail before, and I never, never want to experience that. Yeah. Again, so. That sounds like the kind of thing that you only need to experience once. Yeah, I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty scared about fish and raw fish because of that experience. Ironically, shrimp cocktail, I don't think is even raw, but <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, never again. It was the, it was terrible. I slept yeah. on the bathroom floor. Oof. Rough. So uh, that's how, how we do it. But that's the chemistry behind it. Is it just the acid denatures the proteins? Nice, interesting. This is a super cool username. Uh, so. Megasaurus Rex. Um, my son loves dinosaurs, so <laughs> I love that. Said, uh, sent this to us that she listens on her three hour round trip commute to school, and it's a nice break between studying Ochem. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. So you fill your 
your study breaks with more chemistry. I know. Yeah. That's exactly what I thought. I was yeah. like, shout out Megasaurus, Megasaurus Rex. That's very impressive. But also, I was going to say, be sure to take breaks sometimes. But I really think that this, like, listening to something that puts the science in context makes it way more fun to study it. So I kind of get it. But also, you know, take some breaks where you're, like, not putting things into your brain, too. Like, go on a walk and just look at nature, like a mind massage for yourself. Sit quietly in your room. You can have non-stimulating breaks, too. But also, I wanted to shout out, I hope Oakham's going well for you. If you have questions, let me know. I have some Oakham resources online, too, so you can check those out. I love fellow Oakhamers, you know? Nice. Cut from the same cloth. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this is a slightly longer message, but we got this cool message from a chemistry professor. That's right. Named David. He's in Florida. Um, and here's what he said. As I listen to your back catalog, I want to correct the mistakes that I've noticed. I always tell my students that I'm going to make mistakes. So please let me know what I do as well as comment on things I found interesting or when I learned something new or anything else. I don't know the best way to do this, however, because I have a lot of thoughts and I'm so excited to talk about chemistry, <laughs> but I'm so far behind with where you all are now. Would you two even be interested in hearing thoughts from your very first episode still? If you are, should I send an email per episode? Should I send a big, long email with a couple episodes worth of comments? <laughs> David. Okay. Well, I really liked that for a lot of reasons because I feel like. Well, one, I love the idea of always correcting mistakes. And David clearly comes with the, with the same approach that we do of like, I'm going to make a mistake. It's just a matter of when. <laughs> right. And we've tried to always have that attitude. If we see a mistake in what we've done, we try to correct it as soon as possible. And if you really think about it, you know, we started this podcast when I was just like about a year into my PhD and I already had my master's degree. So, you know, I've learned so, so much from that. I'm sure there are things I would go back and listen and think, oh gosh, I wish I hadn't done that. And there are even things I've learned, you know, about the way that we personify molecules and things like that, that they can be beneficial, but they also come with pitfalls. So to be really careful and warn your students about the, you know, bigger picture, there's all kinds of things that I've learned in my professional life over the course of this podcast. So I always want to know and improve on what I'm doing. And that is, we've always said, a mark of good science. If you can take new information in, process that information, and when it's based in good evidence, make changes to the way you're doing things, that's a mark of good science. Because we can't know everything, but the best thing we can do is incorporate good evidence-based practices into our work. You right, know? right. So... I definitely want to hear about whatever mistakes I made way back when. Now, we might not get to all of them. Right. <laughs> yeah. And we may have already addressed some of them in uh, future Q&Rs. But if you notice something, David or anyone else, please feel free to shoot us an email. Even if I don't respond, I read all of them. Yeah. And we want to hear it. However works for you. You can combine all your thoughts into one long message and send it away or you know, a few episodes at a time or whatever it is, but we definitely want to hear about it. So you, he asked so nicely, but then I thought that was probably a good thing to remind all of our listeners of is we want to hear any corrections you have, any thoughts you have, as long as you send them with good spirits and good intentions, <laughs> that's what we want to hear. Yeah. So yeah, we really appreciate that email. Thanks, David. And David also asked a not as much chemistry related question <laughs> that um, it's a little bit sad, but here's what he said. I'm making my way through all the episodes. I'm curious. Did cryptozoology, the coffee shop, ever open back up? And now what he's referencing, if you're if you're not sure what he's talking about, was this coffee shop that I talked about back during the pandemic that uh, was my favorite coffee shop here in the town we live in, in Denton, Texas, and that it closed during the pandemic. Yeah. And it was like one of my things of the week or whatever mm -hmm. that week at the end of the episode that they closed. So, David, I'm sorry to sad to report that they never opened back up. Um, the owners were they're they're a married couple, and they, you know, were just pretty heartbroken about closing it. But they decided to move on from the world of owning yeah. a coffee shop, and they also decided to start a family. And they were like owning a, our own business at the same time, not not the best thing. So, I think it all kind of turned out for the best. In in 
one sense. It was tragic, but my, to my knowledge, the last I heard from them, they are doing okay. Denton is um, still like mourning the loss of <laughs> having such a good coffee shop like that. But thankfully, we do have other good coffee shops in town. My so. personal favorite, if you're ever in town, is the mug. I think they have the best latte in all of Denton. Nice. There's a latte called the Michigander. Michigander. Ooh, yeah. It's basically Michigan. Yep. Shout out Michigan. Yeah. Shout out Mis- Michigan. It's sweetened with maple syrup, which we've also done episodes on that. Right. Right. And it's just so smooth. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's really good. So if you're ever in Denton, swing by the mug, get yourself a Michigander. Yep. And you'll think, you can thank me later. Yes. They have two locations. One is a coffee stand. It's the original one. Um, and then the other one is actually inside of a little brunch place. And you can get that drink there. And the reason it's called the Michigander is because the owner of the mug, um, our friend and neighbor, Amy, is from Michigan. Yeah. And so little it's, homage. It's good in Michigan maple syrup, too, which maybe <laughs> makes it even better. Oh, yeah. It's legit. <laughs> it's real stuff. So, yes, love that place. So that was a good question and a good place, I think, to wrap it up. So thanks, David. Um, for asking that. And thanks to all of our listeners who have written in with questions, corrections. We really, really appreciate that. And normally at this time, we would go through and thank all of our followers on Ko-Fi. We still have a few over there. So we're going to shout those people out. And then, of course, we're going to thank our Patreon supporters like we do every episode in our closing notes. People who've supported us on Ko-Fi over the past month have been Derek L., Melissa, different Melissa. Yeah, not me. (laughs) I support us in other ways. Kevin, (laughs) Brian K, Jacob T, and a mystery anonymous Ko-Fi supporter. You know who you are. Yeah, thank you so much to our Ko-Fi supporters. We would not be able to do this without you. And we also would not be able to do this without our Patreon supporters. So those people are Nicole C, Timothy P, Bree M, Chris and Claire S, Hunter R, Stephen B, Avishai B, Chelsea B, Christina G. Thank you for everything you do to make chemistry for your life happen and to make chemistry accessible and available for even more people. We're so thankful for all of you for supporting us, for believing in the show, and for caring about sharing chemistry with people. And uh, yeah, we, we could not do this without you guys. This episode of Chemistry for Your Life was created by Melissa Cleaney and Jam Robinson. And we'd like to give a special thanks to E. Robinson, who reviewed this episode. Mm-hmm.